Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Professor of Israel Studies at UCLA. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Chuck Friedman. He's a former Deputy National Security Advisor in Israel and a longtime senior fellow at Harvard's Belfast Center. He also teaches political science at Columbia University, NYU, and Tel Aviv University. Dr. Freelich is the author of Zion's Dilemmas, How Israel Makes National Security Policy, which was published by Cornell University Press in 2012, and Israeli National Security, A New Strategy for an Era of Change, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2018. And his current most new book, Israel and the Cyber Threat, How the Startup Nation Became a Global Cyber Power. She co-authored with Matthew Cohen and Gabby Saboni, which will be published by Oxford University Press in July and is already available for advanced purchase. You will see a link in, the, uh, in our Q&A tab. Uh, Dr. Freelich has also published numerous academic articles, over 150 op-eds, and he also appears frequently as a commentator on US, Israeli, and international television and radio stations. He's previously been a speaker with the Nazarian Center. I'm very happy to have him back today. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Freelich. Well, uh, Professor Waxman, thank you very much for having me back. It's a pleasure. I have your book right here, or one of them on my shelf right here. It's always in front of me. And let me thank the Nazarian Center uh, for hosting the event as well. The topic today is one which is a pleasure to talk about because it's a remarkable story how a country with the population and geographic size of New Jersey has become one of the world's top five cyber powers along with the, the US, Russia, China, and the UK. It's a story which is almost unblemished. It's a story that Israel's friends can be proud of, maybe especially at the present when there are other things happening that people don't feel quite as good about. But this is really something that we can celebrate. I'm going to address pose six questions during the course of the talk, do it rather quickly, and then we'll open it, of course, to a Q&A. But the first question that I want to pose is, why really is cyber important and what makes it different from the physical realm? Well, first of all, there are millions of cyber attacks every day all over the world. Most of them we never hear about because they're deflected rather easily by the, the various target countries' defenses. And so we don't hear about them. But the effect of cyber or the dangers are quite significant. Just cyber crime, or forget for the moment uh, the military side of cyber and all of the other societal and political effects as well. Just cyber crime in 2012 was $8.4 trillion and has grown considerably since then and it's continuing to grow. And cyber isn't just another realm, another area of military conflict, of uh, political confrontation, the socioeconomic impacts. It's what they call in the literature a substrate. In other words, it's something that under, undergirds all of modern life social, economic, cultural, political, military. Advanced societies today can't operate without cyber. I mean, anything that has to do with the computer or communication systems is cyber. We all live in the cyber world today. It's also important to remember that when we talk about cyber attacks, all we're talking about is computer code. Okay, there's nothing in the physical world that happens usually. It's using cyber code as with kinetic attacks, physical attacks to achieve political, military, economic, or whatever effects. We can use it for purposes of disruption, of destruction. We can use it for cyber espionage, for cyber information uh, operations. 
And of course, there's the criminal side as well. But in the end, all we're doing is talking about computer code. And cyber for all countries, certainly advanced cyber countries or in the US or Israel, is a socioeconomic opportunity. It's a socioeconomic threat. And the same on the military level. It's both, both a threat and something that advanced cyber countries use to their advantage. One of the problems is that the more advanced your society is in, in terms of cyber, Yes, there are the advantages, but it also means that you're more vulnerable to cyber attacks. So that countries that are less advanced, maybe they can't hit you as hard. On the other hand, you're, or, you're more vulnerable than they are. So it's unclear who has the advantage. I think most experts and, and any of my own conclusion is that cyber probably ends up benefiting the advanced countries even more than the less advanced ones. But that's still a subject of debate in the literature. And today, actually, the socioeconomic and political dimensions of cyber may even be greater than the military threat. If you look at the impact of cyber information campaign, the Russian attack against the American elections in 2016 uh, through 2022 as well, if you look at all of the attacks on private firms and public organizations around the world, the impact there may be greater than the military side, even cyber warfare. Now, cyber attacks have both lethal and non-lethal effects. There's actually so far been only one documented case of someone who was killed directly by a cyber attack, but there are indirect effects. For example, if you attack a hospital and shut down a uh, critical equipment, patients can die as a result. And if you shut down a water supply, the result is obvious. So you have the indirect lethal effect. You can have indirect physical effect, but most of the impacts are just at the digital level, the impact on the computer systems themselves. Cyber attacks have no geographic limit and they happen simultaneously. You can launch a virtually unlimited number of cyber attacks simultaneously from all parts of the earth. Very different from physical kinetic attacks, which are quite limited. There are only so many bombers you can have, so many artillery pieces, whatever. And physical weapons, conventional and non-conventional, have essentially localized effects. And even a nuclear weapon has a limited effect in terms of the region affected. Uh, if there are multiple nuclear weapons, maybe you can affect not, you can hit not just a city, a, a region, but that's as that's as far as it goes. Cyber can cause systemic effect. Maybe you could shut down a country's electric grid or the electric grid in parts of the country. And I was saying water before or communications. Uh, systems, you could have systemic effects and at least in, in theory, uh, bring a country to its knees without having to fire a shot. That hasn't happened so far, but that's the speculation in the literature. And cyber attacks can enable you to reach far off targets that you might not be able to reach otherwise and that you can reach without causing uh, deaths either to the enemy or to your own forces. Well, that was just uh, by way of a quick background on cyber for those who aren't familiar with it. And now the Israeli side of it. And the second question that I will pose is, why did Israel become a cyber power? How did this happen? Okay, again, this is a really remarkable story. I think it's really hard to think of another socioeconomic and military threat or opportunity, because cyber is both for Israel, it's a socioeconomic threat, a socioeconomic opportunity, a military threat, a military opportunity. It's hard to think of any other threat that Israel geared up for as rapidly and as effectively as it did to the cyber threat. If you take a look at the, the rocket threat, Hezbollah, Hamas, 
which emerged around the same time as cyber did in the, in the 90s. Israel has not succeeded in gearing up quite as effectively, or at least not as rapidly. And if you compare it to most states in the world, Israel really did uh, gear up for the cyber threat far earlier than most. As a matter of fact, it was one of the first countries to take the cyber threat seriously. And it was one of the first countries to develop a, a cyber strategy and the institutions and capabilities necessary for implementing that strategy. I think that Israel's cyber capabilities are part of its broader high-tech prowess. Israel is considered the second or maybe now the third primary center of high-tech in, high in the world. I'm saying third because I think China uh, pushed us into third place in the last year or so. And the truth is, I don't feel too terrible about that because the last time I looked, there were a few more Chinese in the world than there are Israelis. But Israel has the world's, the most uh, high tech dependent economy in the world. The highest concentration of scientists in the world per capita, the largest number of high tech startups per capita. As a matter of fact, I mean, this is, here's an astonishing statistic. The number of, sci of cyber startups in Israel is equal to the total number in the entire world, except for the United States. About a third of cybersecurity investment in the world is in Israel. Israel has long been ranked number one in uh, investment in the world uh, for, for its GDP. Approximately double the OECD average. I think cyber like high tech generally simply fits Israel like a glove in terms of our national character, our capabilities, uh, the size of the investments needed, the number of people needed. Cyber basically doesn't require huge investments for lots of people. They just have to be really very, very high quality. Quality is always important in the cyber world. It's absolutely critical. Cyber education starts in Israel for the kids who want it in sixth grade. It goes all the way up through university. And all the universities have programs today. But the real, there are, there are a few primary sources of this cyber revolution. One is the symbiotic relationship in Israel between the defense establishment, meaning the IDF, the intelligence agencies, and a couple of other government agencies. But between the defense establishment, the civilian branches of the government, the private sector, and academia. Now, in most countries in the world, and in most democracies, including the US, and even more so in Europe and other countries, there's great hesitancy to cooperate, or great hesitancy, I should say, on the part of the private sector to cooperate with the government, and especially the defense establishment in cyber and in various other areas, in Israel, that hesitancy is largely not there. It's partly a result of the decades of conflict that Israel's faced and the close relationship that exists generally between the defense establishment and other sectors. It's partly because everybody has served uh, pretty much in the IDF and so they feel more comfortable with uh, that kind of cooperation. But the defense establishment has been a primary, an absolutely primary engine of the cyber revolution in Israel. It creates the demand for much of the products. They drive what a lot of the commercial uh, cyber firms do, create the need for it. They provide the personnel for much of the commercial cyber sector simply because they're, the guys are all, the people working in these companies have, for the most part, been trained in the IDF's cyber unit. Some really elite units, uh, they serve as incubators uh, for technological innovation. And they're a primary source of all the cyber firms that are actually launched in Israel. A huge percentage of all the cyber firms were are headed by veterans of the different uh, cyber units. Most of the, the personnel are veterans of the cyber units. One of the units, uh, Intelligence Unit 81, which is a highly advanced tech, intelligence technology organization 
A friend of mine compares it for, for those who used to watch the uh, James Bond movies, a little bit like uh, Q, the guy who comes up with all of the fancy newfangled uh, gadgets. Well, that's what Unit 81 does. To give you an example, 100 veterans of the unit who served between two, 2003 and 2010 ended up founding 50 startups during one decade alone with accumulated valuations of over $10 billion. And that's just one unit. A big part of this, so first of all, it's this symbiotic relation, but another big part of the relationship is is a compulsory service. There are only a few countries in the world, certainly only a couple of democracies that have compulsory military service. And in many ways, it's of course a necessary evil, but it also happens to be a huge boon for Israel's high tech capabilities and cyber specifically, because the IDF gets the very best minds in the country essentially for free for a few years. 1% of high school graduates are sent each year to universities before their military service to study computer science and related topics. The IDF itself is a huge educational machine training people, uh, the, the absolute cyber geniuses. There's a famous program, uh, which seeks out the top 2% of high school graduates each year. Of that 2%, only 10% pass the initial screening. And then uh, there's an absolute grueling testing system, which further wins down, winnows down the number of people actually accepted to the program. Unit 81 uh, puts 10,000 people a year through their screening process, only a few hundred are accepted. All told, something like 10,000 soldiers a year go through various IDF cyber training courses. And the result is that, astonishingly, Israel has cyber personnel, I'm talking now Israel in the military sense, on a par with a global superpower like the United States. The American National Security Agency, the signals and cyber uh, espionage or intelligence gathering agency is only about four times the size of the Israeli equivalent, Unit 8200. The United States is about 40 times the total size and population. So the NSA is only four times the size of 8200. Each year, the IDF discharges about somewhere between a few hundred and 1300, we don't know the precise number of top-notch cyber um, experts, okay? The best of the best. China in 2022 had a graduating class at, their, at the National Cybersecurity School of 1300. And as I said before, they're, they're a lot bigger than we are. So just amazing numbers quantitatively and qualitatively. The IDF inculcates uh, the conscripts with its organizational uh, culture, tenacity, creativity, improvisation, out of the box thinking, doing all of this under very uh, uh, challenging circumstances with uh, high time pressures. People are getting command experience, professional experience, experience in working under these conditions at an age when their peers in the rest of the world are still young people. They're still in college or maybe their first jobs. And maybe the biggest of the biggest of the biggest sources uh, of secrets of Israel's success is its innovative national culture, what we call in the book, chutzpah gan viral. And chutzpah gun viral is a deeply ingrained propensity. To a certain extent, this is a general Jewish uh, identity, maybe, but it's certainly an Israeli one. A propensity to always challenge authority, the accepted way of doing things, accepted norms, practices, an ongoing, never-ending refusal to take no for an answer and a constant search 
for finding alternative means of achieving your objective. Israelis also partly, again, because of Israel's uh, security circumstances, have a high tolerance for risk taking. And failure is not considered to be a big, a big deal culturally. In some countries, of course, you lose faith. There's a belief in hard work and out of the box thinking. If you really try hard enough, you'll succeed. Israel in general, in general, is a very non-hierarchical, -hier very informal country. And these are the attributes of uh, high-tech companies generally. Israel's national characteristics are very, very similar to those of high-tech firms around the world. All right, the third question is, what's the cyber threat that Israel faces? First of all, Israel is one of the top targets of cyber attacks in the world. Uh, it's a constant daily barrage from states, non-state act actors, so-called hacktivist groups, individuals, criminals. Prime Minister Netanyahu defined cyber as one of the top four threats that Israel faces. Essentially, every type of computer system in Israel has been attacked at, at one point or another, or more than one point. Hospital, Velal, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, the Bank of Israel, TV stations, electric water and communications firms, in other words, critical national infrastructure. Every year, one of the hacktivist groups, Anonymous, launches a major campaign against Israel on Yom HaShoah, on Holocaust Remembrance Day, the objective being to threaten Israel with, I quote, an electronic Holocaust and to erase Israel from the cyberspace. In 2019, Israel hosted the Eurovision Song Contest. For those who aren't familiar with it, it's uh, the, not just European countries, a few others, but mostly European countries. It's a huge annual music extravaganza. Hundreds of millions of people see it each year. All right, Israel won in 2018, so it was the host in 2019. Hackers just about succeeded in inserting fake footage uh, right in the middle of the live broadcast, which would have showed rockets raining down on Tel Aviv. Now, imagine if they had succeeded the hit to Israel's international image if that had happened. In 2020, Israel hosted the international commemoration for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. 60 heads of states uh, participated, including Vice President Pence, President Putin, President Macron, then Prince Charles. Chinese, Iranian, North Korean, Russian, and Poland hackers launched attacks against the 800 aircraft bringing the various dignitaries and others uh, excuse me, 800 cyber attacks against the aircraft bringing the, the dignitaries to Israel. Again, imagine if any of these attacks had succeeded, not in downing the planes, but just in diverting them or something, or causing them significant difficulty, what that would have done again to Israel's international image. Iran conducts extensive cyber information or cyber influence operations against Israel. There's an Iranian website called Countdown 2040. 2040 is the year by which, according to the website, and I think this is an Iranian position generally, uh, the year by which Israel will cease to exist. The website uh, spreads discourse uh, designed to spoke, stoke tensions in Israel, to promote divisive discourse, influence elections, up to half a million people a month in, in Israel see it. They don't realize it's an Iranian website. In 2016, an Iranian affiliated website quoted then Defense Minister Moshe Yailon as saying, if Pakistan sends troops to Syria to fight ISIS, we will destroy them with a nuclear attack. The Pakistani defense minister saw what uh, Ye Lun had supposedly said, and he responded, Israel forgets that Pakistan's a nuclear state too. 
and the Israeli Ministry of Defense was understandably rather concerned by a potential escalation with a nuclear power and rapidly issued a clarification that the whole thing was just a fabrication. And much like the US and other democracies, Israel deeply worried about potential effects to influence and subvert the electoral processes. There have been a number of attempts by Iran, possibly the Russians. To date, they haven't succeeded, but the number and the sophistication of the attack is increasing. Military computer systems in Israel are, of course, uh, a focus of lots of attacks. Uh, Iran, for example, tried to seize control of Israeli drones over Gaza in 2014. Iran has tried to use Facebook and uh, other social media to recruit uh, people for uh, purposes of terrorism in Israel. Uh, Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas have repeatedly used uh, cyber information operations or social media campaigns to try and uh, gain intelligence from soldiers, uh, primarily. They've targeted them a lot. Israel, as we all know, relies on a primarily reservist military. Well, imagine in a time of crisis where the war has just begun or is about to begin, and let's say that the adversary, whoever it is at the time, succeeds in disrupting power, communication, transportation system. Let's say they just managed to shut down traffic lights in Tel Aviv. Within minutes, the entire country is one big traffic snarl. And I didn't go to the extreme case where they shut down all the traffic lights in the country. And reservists can't reach their units for hours and, and maybe beyond. And if there are no computers, so there's no internet, there's no cellular communications, how do you run a country? Especially, especially if there's no electricity. So um, attacks both on military sites and critical national infrastructure could make all the difference in a country like Israel, where the time limits are very, very short. Iran is the number one adversary that Israel faces in the cyber realm, as it is in all other areas. For the most part, Israel has been quite successful in defending itself. Most of the attacks that have taken place have not been that, that sophisticated, and most of them have been prevented by Israel's defensive system. Not all, but most. So the fourth question is, how has Israel responded to the, the cyber threat, uh, both the public uh, or private one and the military one? Well, first of all, uh, Israel, as I said, was one of the first countries to ever formulate a national cyber strategy and the institutions necessary, the Israel National Cyber Directorate, it's been in operation since 2015, actually earlier on the previous incarnation. And here the, pre the previous problem, or the, the, the primary uh, concept that they developed is that, well, the cyber realm is vast. Pretty all of us are part of it as individuals and every private firm pretty much and every public sector organization or agency, everybody is using cyber all the time. Computers and communication system. There's no way that one or two or whatever number of government agencies can protect everybody all the time. And so, first of all, the conclusion was that these individuals and firms and organizations have to bear primary responsibility for their own security. The role of the National Cyber Director is to help them do that by providing training, by providing the appropriate regulation, by providing warnings of major attacks, but they have to bear primary responsibility. And the second point was that where the, the National Cyber Directorate will really get involved directly is the critical national infrastructure and other vital systems, maybe not absolutely critical to the uh, functioning of the country, but let's say one rung below that. They're responsible for the civil sector, the public and private sector. And then of course, uh, the IDF, the fifth, the fifth question, is how has it happened on the military level? Well, the IDF and the intelligence agencies 
are responsible for addressing the military cyber threat. And as in other areas of, uh, of conflict, Israel's cyber strategy is mostly offensive, and Israel has reportedly already made effective use of cyber for strategic purposes. Most people have probably heard of the so-called Stuxnet attack in 2010, which was a his it was considered the first case ever of a cyber attack that actually caused physical damage. It disrupted or destroyed uh, over a thousand Iranian nuclear cent uh, centrifuges, and had there not been a glitch, glitch and it got out, maybe the whole program would have been destroyed at the time. In any event, it was it was still a dramatic uh, event. Uh, probably one of the, one of the greatest uh, intelligent coups. Of, so, uh, uh, espionage cases in, in history. And Israel also apparently used it in the attack against the Syrian nuclear reactor in 2007. And cyber lets Israel attack faraway places. There have been reports of lots of Israeli attacks against uh, targets in Iran to do so without risking Israeli forces or um, enemy civilians. In wartime, obviously, we don't know what, if and what Israel has, but obviously, there is the potential for systemic effects. It's also been an integral part of the so-called the Mabam, the Malachah ben Amulchamot, the campaign between the wars, in other words, the ongoing operations that Israel has been waging in Syria to prevent Iranian uh, entrenchment to the buildup of Iranian forces there, to prevent the transfer of weapons uh, to Hezbollah in Lebanon through Syria. It's clear that cyber is a complementary capability for Israel. Uh, the IDF doesn't think it's going to ever wage cyber wars. Uh, even if it started as a cyber war, it'll probably escalate to a, a regular kinetic war pretty quickly. Cyber has become the primary means by which Israel and basically all advanced states collect intelligence. And I said it's not a, st a standalone capability for Israel. It's something that Israel uses in combination with all other capabilities, military, economic, diplomatic, et cetera. And something where it tries to achieve cyber deterrence over time through a cumulative process. Uh, no one or two or 10 attacks are gonna do it, but over time, if you cause damage, then maybe eventually you can persuade the adversary that it's not worth doing. It's early, I believe, to conclude whether Israel's experience indicates, there's a big debate in the, in the cyber literature, whether cyber is more or less escalatory than kinetic attacks. Israel's experience, I don't think, gives us a clear answer yet, probably leaning to the latter, in other words, less escalatory. There does seem to be some level between, below which cyber clearly is escalatory. It's not clear what level exactly that is. Above it, the risk of escalation, of course, increase. I think uh, one thing is clear is that Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas do believe that cyber is less escalatory. So they uh, conducted numerous attacks against Israel. And I, maybe they're right because Israel's responses to cyber attacks have not been escalatory. In other words, they've, for the most part, remained in the uh, cyber realm. We only know of one or two cases where Israel responded on kinetically, in other words, physical. The US is Israel's primary partner in the cyber realm as it is in all other areas. It's an area though where, unlike not all, but almost all other areas of bilateral cooperation, Israel is pretty much an equal partner here. It gives as much as it gets from the US. Its homegrown capabilities are on a par with those of the United States. Uh, so from that point of view, it, it's nice. Um, Israel can partly pay back the debt that it owes the U.S. Cyber has provided both the U.S. and Israel acting in concert. The Stuxnet attack against the Iranian nuclear program that I was talking about was apparently a joint operation. I think it's pretty much the ultimate example of what cyber cooperation can, can look like. We don't know yet if and how cyber has been incorporated into Israel's counterproliferation strategy. People may be familiar with the term the Begin Doctrine, the doctrine enunciated by former Prime Minister Begin, which says that 
Israel will not allow an enemy state in the Middle East to acquire a military cyber capability. And so the attack against the Iraqi reactor in 1981, the Syrian reactor in 2007, those were both airstrikes. Those were implementations of the strategy, of the Begin Doctrine. Interestingly, to date, Israel hasn't done it against Iran, and that's a whole different uh, talk, why Israel hasn't done it and what it would entail if Israel decides to. But maybe Stuxnet, maybe the other reported attacks that have happened over the years, uh, cyber attacks that have, reported, that have happened in Iran over the years, maybe this indicates a new way to implement the Begin Doctrine. So the final question is, uh, what's the bottom line? What does all this mean for Israel? Let me start with the bad news. There's still, despite a few decades of effort, it's now a good 20 years, not more, there's still concern about the actual level of security achieved, cybersecurity, especially of, of the uh, commercial sector. We look, there's been, there have been a lot of attacks in the last few years that have succeeded in hitting private firms, and some of them private firms of considerable importance. Uh, it's still not critical infrastructure, but various important effects. There's even question whether critical infrastructure is sufficiently well defended. If you read the media, there are some who are worried about the level of defense, even of military targets. Cyber upper, uh, information operations, provide Israel's adversaries with a whole new way to conduct the information war, the Hasbara, the, the diplomatic war against Israel. They can reach millions of people around the world virtually for free. Uh, they can try and affect Israel's political processes, electoral processes. And because we are so much more dependent on cyber than most of our adversaries, we are more vulnerable from that point of view. For all of Israel's cyber prowess, there's a huge shortage of personnel, which is a constraint on how far Israel can go in the area. Uh, we have not been investing enough in academic cyber research in recent years, which you need for developing basic science, uh, scientific knowledge. Um, the cyber industry seems to have um, matured. The number of new startups has decreased rapidly. I said in the beginning that this is a story which is mostly unblemished. Well, there is one blemish and one of significance. Uh, many have probably read about the so-called NSO scandal, the name of an Israeli offensive cyber firm, which went too far and supplied these capabilities to some rather unsavory authoritarian regimes. Now, partly this was done with the government's uh, not just approval, but even encouragement, because it contributed significantly to the breakthrough to the Abraham Accords and to the unofficial ties with the Saudis, but the firm went too far and it caused an international scandal. But to end with the good news, in a world which is increasingly averse to physical and especially lethal damage, Cyber provides the ability to achieve important military objectives without causing, usually without causing either. I believe that cyber has strengthened Israel's overall national power, uh, provides it with critical advantages over its adversaries. No other Middle Eastern country has a cyber ecosystem that is nearly as advanced as Israel's, uh, nor has applied cyber nearly as much for military purposes. It's had an important impact on Israel's regional and international standing. I already mentioned that, that the contribution to the breakthrough of the Abraham Accords, but Israel has cyber cooperation agreements with 100 countries around the world today. It's been an important means of improving ties with critical countries such as the UK, India, China, and others. And as I said, it's a critical, it's an important part of cooperation with the US. It's a significant portion of Israel's economy today. And finally, Israel isn't just uh, sitting on its laurels, it's investing heavily in the AI revolution, less so in quantum. The, the scales of investment there are beyond a 
a limited Israeli um, effort, but in AI, Israel will probably also be a world leader as it was in cyber. So let me uh, thank Professor Waxman once again for hosting this in the, the Nazarian Center and be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Chuck. That was fascinating. And we've had quite a few questions coming in. So I'm going to start uh, just uh, uh, choosing a few of those questions. A couple of the questions um, asked about uh, the, uh, the, the, the issue that you touched upon at the end about uh, the NSO group and um, its uh, product Pegasus. Um, so the question, what was, uh, does the government, the Israeli government, attempt to regulate private companies like NSO uh, in terms of uh, what they sell to foreign governments? Uh, and, and another question related, you know, how can Israel control company, these companies like LSO uh, from selling its, its Pegasus software or other kinds of software to authoritarian governments to spy on journalists? So, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, international publicity around that, um, negative, very negative publicity for Israel. Um, so, you know, um, given the, the close connections between the defense establishment, the Israeli government and these private uh, sector companies, why, uh, you know, is Israel doing enough, I guess, to regulate their exports? What more could it be doing? Yeah, of course, an uh, important question. But first of all, let me say, through all the criticism, remember we're talking about a cyber weapon, which with rare exceptions, there's only one known case of a lethal effect. Uh, it's been used to help authoritarian regimes do the bad things that those kinds of regimes do. Not nice. On the other hand, the United States and the UK and France and every other country worth its salt in the world today sells kinetic weapons, okay? Sell bombers and tanks and artillery, and they are all designed for one thing, to kill people. So let's put things in proportion. Second of all, NSO went too far. I think uh, there's a cross between a bit of uh, hubris and recklessness. They went too far. Part of the global, there was a big scandal, a global scandal over this. Part of it, I believe, was simply Israel bashing. There are American, British, German, Italian, and other firms doing things very similar to NSO, uh, apparently not quite as well, and maybe not as brazenly, but not very dissimilar. Part of this was simply, if it wasn't Israel, it would not have received the attention. Okay. Having said that, they went too far. Uh, they did so with the government's encouragement. And by the way, it helped to bring about the breakthrough with the Abraham Accords. I think the benefits here vastly outweigh the, the costs. But the Ministry of Defense belatedly realized what had happened and the price uh, that Israel was paying and did clamp down. They imposed, it's not as if there was no regulation in advance, there was. They clamped down even more. and. The problem is today that they, maybe they had no choice, but Israel's offensive cyber sector is in very bad shape and is pretty close to collapse at this point. It's mostly cyber defense, cyber security, which is also a nice, uh, a nice sized industry, but the offensive side is pretty much done with. Well, I'm, I'm, why, why, what explains that collapse? Why had the, uh, why, given the fact that you said that Israel is particularly, you know, engaged in kind of cyber offense, its strategy is cyber offense. No, that's the government cyber strategy. Right, but, the IDF, that's the intelligence agencies. That's not what private firms are allowed to do. No, no, I'm, I'm but, it, but given the connections between, you mentioned that kind of symbiotic relationship, so given if the government and if the defense establishment's focusing on that, why would the private yeah, sector- they can, sell it, they can sell it to the, to the, to is, the Israeli, uh, to the defense establishment, they can't sell it abroad. Now, a lot of the offensive capabilities are uh, developed in-house or in partnership with these companies, but the companies that were selling abroad, there are only a few left. Um, I see. Where, so they just don't have the- 
a large enough market essentially for their for their products. Well, they're not being yeah, I, yeah. It was cut to thirty odd. I forget the precise number of countries in the world to which they could sell. Essentially, all uh, Western countries, the EU, Japan, Korea, maybe one, Australia. But I mean, that was it. So uh, another question I have, and this this actually comes from me. Um, so you know, I think obviously I would imagine part of what motivated you to write this book was to be so that people are more aware of what's happening in this in this growing realm um, and, of, and of Israel's involvement in it. Do you think that cyber attacks, you mentioned that there are numerous cyber attacks that have taken place, they're taking place regularly, they're targeted every, every sector of Israel that you can imagine. But, do you, but I think there's very little public awareness of these attacks taking place and very little public knowledge about them. Do you think that should change? Should they be more publicized so that people understand the dangers? Um, or is there a kind of more deliberate approach not to publicize these attacks so that they don't broadcast Israel's vulnerabilities, for example, to its enemies? I think actually they are, it's covered extensively in the Israeli media. Maybe, maybe even too much in terms of um, showing vulnerability and letting the enemy know what they've achieved, I think they probably, well, I was going to say they probably know anyway. I don't think they can fully understand the effect, actually. Um, no, I mean, every couple of days, there's an article in some, one of the major media, and sometimes when something's happening, which is pretty often, every Every Israeli newspaper and the TV stations are all covering it. So you think the public is um, informed enough to know about these? I think certainly the, the parts of the public that you would want to be aware of it, yeah. Yeah, not everyone, obviously. Um, so um, uh, related, you know, in, in focusing specifically on, on cyber warfare and, uh, you know, the development of cyber warfare, both offense and defense, um, do you think in terms of the international laws and rules and regulations around this? I mean, you know, um, kinetic warfare, we have, you know, Geneva Convention, we have Hague, we have, you know, centuries of the development of the laws or rules around warfare. Um, is there an attempt to develop these kinds of rules or laws that could guide cyber warfare to, because it seems that this is a kind of an area and, and a new area of warfare without any of the kind of regulations or rules that may, may potentially um, you know, shape uh, the evolution of this realm of, of cyber warfare. That's a critical area. And, and the answer is yes, there are attempts to develop international norms, preferably international law and treaties, but that's very, very hard to do in the cyber area. And uh, so how about if we just develop some norms and CBMs, confidence building measures? The attempts have been underway for a couple of decades now, and there's very limited progress for a variety of reasons. First of all, it, it, for, for, in effect, we're talking about um, arms control agreement. The difference is that these are agreements that are supposed to govern virtual weapons. You can't see them, you can't count them. Uh, and it, an attack can take place without the attackee even knowing that it's been under attack, okay? The attacks very often go through third or fourth and fifth uh, uh, countries. They never knew that their countries were transiting. So, if nobody knows it's happening in many cases, how do you regulate it? There are other problems. Um, the, U the US, uh, the European Union, the Western countries are trying to develop international norms and hopefully laws that are in accordance with the open free Western internet concept. It's called the multi-stakeholder approach. Russia and China, among others, uh, unsurprisingly, don't 
favor that. They want something which is much more controlled. They want complete control over their domestic cyber realm, over their own internet. And they want to be able to actually affect what happens around the world to a certain extent. China has got a massive global cyber surveillance campaign underway. They don't want that limited. Okay, uh, Iran, North Korea, they don't want to be limited. So it's very hard. And then let's be perfectly frank, uh, the US, Israel, other countries that are thought to have a big lead in the cyber area aren't so uh, uh, thrilled to give up that advantage. So th there are lots of th things. And uh, now if we're talking specifically Israel, Israel's also got limited, as I think for a very good reason, based on a lot of past experience, has got limited faith in the efficacy of international treaties. We saw what happened. Uh, four of the five known cases, five cases in the world of uh, nuclear proliferation happened in here, okay? Uh, or almost happened here, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya. And these were all countries that were signatories to the NPT. It prevented nothing. Yeah, there are a couple of cases in the chemical area as well. So Israel says, all right, if we're going to do this, it has to be very effective. We don't believe it can be for the, for the meantime. Let's maybe wait for this to mature a bit before we can adopt the norms of the world. Um, I want to pick up on a point you made about, you know, the difficulty of tracing a cyber attack, right? The, difference that, between, the difficulty of tracing a cyber attack, but it, that, given that difficulty, um, you know, that raises maybe, does that not raise a kind of fundamental problem for cyber deterrence? Because the whole premise of deterrence is that you can identify the source right. of the attack and, and, and respond in kind. Um, so so is, is cyber deterrence or cyber, you know, a kind of contradiction then, given the fact that it becomes almost impossible to actually respond if you cannot trace where the attack originated? That was a really major worry a few years ago. It seems now that uh, it, it's called the attribution problem. Advanced countries, advanced cyber-wise, advanced intelligence-wise, the US, Israel, others seem to have developed the capabilities in the meantime to, to usually be able to attribute an attack. Now, if you're looking for uh, courtroom level proof, you may not have it. But if you're talking about proof at the intelligence level, at the policy level, they can usually do it. And what makes it a bit easier for Israel than let's say a global superpower like the US is that the number of enemies, in, in theory, it's unlimited. In fact, as we know, it's gonna be either Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, or some other Palestinian organization that may be, and some hacktivists around the world, okay? The range of threat that Israel has to worry about is more limited than let's say the US. And since these are countries that are already covered extensively in, from an intelligence point of view. Since we're familiar with their objectives, with their general modus operandi, that makes the attribution a, a bit easier in Israel's case. But you're absolutely right that it's a problem, that there's no guarantees here. And you don't wanna, let's say, launch a major response, let alone a war uh, <laughs> and get it wrong, right? So, um, so just to follow up on that, is Iran? You mentioned Iran being Israel's primary strategic adversary in that in this realm. Is Iran, as far as you know, providing cyber technology or cyber warfare technology uh, to its uh, allies like Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, in the way that it's provided, you know, uh, arms? Is it also um, because that seems much harder to stop? than, you know, interdicting uh, arms uh, shipments. So we don't have smoking guns, but if you look at a number of things that they've done, especially Hamas, I think the answer is pretty clear. And I say especially Hamas, because what's really interesting, there's a lot of information about Hamas and Iranian cyber attacks. The sum total of knowledge about Hezbollah attacks I think I wrote something about two pages in the book. That's it. They're, now, is that because they don't have the capabilities or is it because their operational uh, secrecy is really good? I tend to believe it's the latter, but I don't have proof. There are 
one or two Hezbollah attacks, and there are a bunch of Hamas attacks that look too similar to the type of things that the Iranians have done. Uh, we have some information, let's say, about people going back and forth uh, to train uh, people in cyber. So the answer is probably yes, but don't have a better answer for you than that. So uh, a couple of questions about personnel. Uh, one, um, uh, in terms of the, the origins, I wonder um, what role, what impact the mass immigration of Jews from the former Soviet Union played in the development of the cyber industry, because so many of those immigrants from the FSU were highly educated, highly trained, computers, scientists, engineers, and like, was that a critical factor in promoting the industry? And then another question comes from the audience now, and you can take both of them because we only have a little bit of time. How worried are you about the threat of high-tech companies leaving, or those working in high-tech companies leaving now if the proposed judicial overhaul goes ahead? We won't be talking about the judicial overhaul, but do you worry that that, that you know, the, 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 the potential high-tech companies or at least their employees leading. So two parts, the emigration and uh, immigration and emigration. Look, the, the Russian Aliyah had a huge impact on Israeli society in a whole variety of areas, uh, almost all for the benefit and certainly in the high-tech area. With most of the, emig the immigration was in the early 90s. So it's 30 years ago. Mm. So most of the people who came then are either later in their careers or who retired in the meantime. And if they're later in their careers, the specific cyber knowledge, maybe not their education as a whole, but their cyber knowledge is certainly very outdated from that point of view. Now, of course, many of them have... I've studied in Israel and are working in the cyber company, so they've updated their knowledge. But I think it's more, at this point, the descendant. And I don't know the numbers, but I'm confident that they are overrepresented in the, in the cyber firm. In terms of the judicial reforms and the impact on cyber, high tech generally, look, I, the good news is I think that the judicial reforms are at a will at a minimum be postponed and hopefully will not happen. The public response has been quite remarkable. I think the impact on the Israeli economy, high tech and otherwise, is going to take longer to repair because Israel's international image was correctly hurt very badly by this. And the, the high tech sector is particularly sensitive to it. We have time maybe for one last question um, from Darko Sikhanovich. Um, uh, and he's asking about the combination of offensive cyber capabilities and AI and artificial intelligence. Where do you think that might go in the future? Uh, I know that's a broad question, uh, so you can, you know, take it any way you want. That's the million dollar question that everyone's uh, talking about nowadays. Um, I don't think a day goes by pretty much without an article or two in the Times and the Washington Post. I think, first of all, we don't know. No one seems to know what this technology can do. Pretty remarkable. In the past, we pretty much knew. And it's clearly going to have a dramatic effect on all walks of life, uh, whether it's in the national security area, the, the economic area, the cultural area. It's being applied to everything that people are doing. So the short answer is uh, I think the impact will be huge. Uh, the longer answer, we'll have to wait and see. Well, I think that's a, a good note to end. I want to thank you for that very, very informative and thorough presentation. I want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us and encourage you all uh, to go out and get a copy of the book. It's already uh, available for uh, pre-ordering. There's a link in our uh, chat uh, box. You can, you can uh, access it through that. Um, and the book will be coming out again in July this summer. So thank you, Dr. Freelich, for joining us. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And this talk will also be available on our, on our webpage as well as on our YouTube channel. Thanks very much.